Welcome today to our joint uh, Melbourne Children's Global Health Forum with our uh, Centre of Research Excellence in Pneumococcal Disease Control for the Asia Pacific region, a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, my name is Alicia Potch, I'm a general paediatrician here and a PhD student with the Department of Peds and the Asia Pacific Health Group at MCRI. And I'll be co-chairing with Darren Ong today for the session. I'd like to start the session with acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet the Wurundjeri people with the Kula Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, in, the, in the community. So as we mentioned, this is a joint effort between our two uh, groups today. I'm still in the screen. Um, uh, and I'm delighted to, to co-chair this session with, with Darren today. So Darren's our program coordinator for the CRE for pneumococcal disease, and he's also our newly minted uh, MCGH committee forum uh, member as well. We've also got two other new committee uh, members who hopefully are joining us online. Um, we've got Dr. Marianne Safe and Dr. John Hart. Marianne's a paediatrician and ED physician, who is our global health uh, fellow for this year and next year. And John Hartz, our medical epidemiologist who does a lot of global health work with the Asia Pacific Health Group at MCRI as well, um, as well as Darren and myself. So if we see us around and you, there are topics that you want to hear about in the global health forums, please reach out and we'll do our best to, to make that happen. Um, so today's session is very timely on the back of World Immunisation Week just last week. So we know one of the biggest impacts of the COVID pandemic has been the, the global decline of uh, childhood immunisations across, across the globe, essentially, um, leading to outbreaks of a lot of preventable diseases like uh, tetanus and, and polio and, and measles. So the WHO with their global and, and national partners are, are launching the big catch-up campaign, I think they've called it, um, and it's important to have uh, immunisation policy um, and, and night takes in place that are backed by evidence and, and policy um, uh, stakeholders that can govern and inform those decisions as well. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. Today is a hybrid session. We've got two speakers in person with us, but we've also got our uh, international collaborator, Dr. Benita, on the screen there, joining us from Laos. Um, so just allow the presenters to get through their, their presentations. We'll leave the Q&A until the end. So hold your questions for those in the room. Um, those online, please post in the Q&A um, box and we'll definitely get to your uh, questions towards the end of the session. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Darren, who's going to introduce the topic and, and our speakers for today. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Alicia. Are we going to... Yes, musical chairs. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks for the um, introduction, Alicia. Uh, yeah, my name is Darren. I uh, coordinate the CRE for Pneumococcal Disease Control in the Asia Pacific uh, and am a new uh, addition to the MCGH forum. Uh, so we've got three uh, stellar speakers uh, lined up for today, but unlike Alicia, I'll need to go off a script because otherwise I don't think I'd do justice to um, introducing the, today's topic as well um, as the speakers. Uh, so the data needed to make immunization policy regarding new vaccine introduction or schedule changes uses a combination of vaccine safety and efficacy data, local burden of disease data, and in some settings, cost effectiveness analyses. Some countries have limited local data to support evidence-based decision-making. National immunization technical advisory groups, often referred to as NITAGs, independently assess scientific evidence to advise immunization policy decision-makers. Uh, for the past two decades, MCRI has partnered with academics, clinicians, and policymakers from across the Asia Pacific region to support the generation of data to inform immunization policy. Uh, today's forum will discuss the role of NITAGs in immunization policymaking, uh, as well as the need to generate local data, and uh, the team's new project to support the capacity of the Lao NITAG in evidence. Uh, based decision making and the local University of Health Sciences in generating data. So today we've got Professors Fiona Russell and Professor Nigel Crawford uh, here with us in person and Dr. Vanita uh, joining us from Laos. Uh, so I'll introduce the speakers together um, in the beginning and just hand over uh, the floors of the speakers so that we can maximize the time that we have here for presentations today. So first we've got Professor Nigel Crawford, uh, who's a consultant pediatrician and vaccinologist 
He's group leader of the Victorian Vaccine Safety Service, SAFEVIC, and leads the immunization services at the Royal Children's Hospital. He's currently chair of the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunization. Internationally, he is the WHO Western Pacific Region representative of the Global NITAC Network. Uh, after Nigel's talk, we'll be um, joined by Professor Fiona Russell, who's a pediatrician, epidemiologist, and vaccine researcher. She's group leader of the Asia Pacific Health Group at MCRI and director of the Child and Adolescent Health PhD program at the University of Melbourne's Department of Pediatrics. She's a member of the WHO Collaborating Centre for Child and Neonatal Health Research and Training and chairs the Australas Australasian Society of Infectious Diseases Vaccination Special Interest Group. And finally, we'll be joined by Dr. Vanida Doa Bongpa, who is a pediatrician and epidemiologist from Mahaso Hospital in Lao PDR. She is the in-country lead for the team's NITAC support project, and her research interests include pediatric infectious diseases, tropical medicine, and vaccine preventable diseases. Now I'll hand over to Nigel. Great, thanks um, Darren, and thanks everyone for the opportunity and the, the nice introduction. I'll jump in, particularly because the interest of time and, and make sure we get a chance for a discussion at the end. Um, just want to acknowledge all the different people involved in this project. We need to talk through obviously a bit more specifics of what the project is entailing, but these are all the different um, groups that have been involved. You can see it's a broad number of both Australian uh, technical support team, as well as our colleagues in Laos, WHO and other groups within the region supporting. But we'll go through them in more detail. We just want to acknowledge right up front, lots of people uh, involved in this project, which is supported by um, DFAT. So I'm going to just give a, about a 10 minute sort of talk around NITAGs more broadly. Darren's going to explain what they are. And um, before kind of going to what they are, I'm going to say what they aren't. So a NITAG is an immunisation advisory group that's meant to give what we say frank and fearless advice to government. It's, it's independent of um, government. It's also different to a regulator. It's not someone that's just authorising the vaccine or going through the data. It's actually how can that vaccine be utilised. So. Um, I think thinking of those components and then how we can support that in Laos with some of the expertise that we have here in Australia is, is really part of the project. Starting with a couple of references, these are from Philip Duclos, um, who's been closely involved in the ADVAC vaccinology course and other groups wrote these papers a while ago now, but it really outlines some of the guidance for how to set up uh, a NITAG and how to strengthen them. And, and Laos fortunate enough to have a NITAG and this is all about how we can strengthen and um, support that, that development. And again, there's been quite a lot of support you know, internationally over time through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There was another group in um, uh, Europe, in France, that was supporting this work. And now more specifically, it's being supported through the Global NITAG Network, which Darren mentioned. And I'll talk through specifically that group and some of the resources that are coming, because it's really a global effort to support NITAGs uh, internationally. So this slide's really just trying to explain what's the difference between a regulator and a, a NITAG advice. So what it's trying to do is actually take on all of the evidence around the vaccine, and it's often happening now in parallel as the vaccines are being um, authorised, but I'll, I'll talk to that in, in more detail in the next slide. Taking all the evidence around uh, that vaccines and how it might be applicable to that particular country, their individual needs and requirements is where the country specific information comes on. But a regulator, has a little bit of a different issue. They're obviously looking at the vaccine product, its production, the trial data, the manufacturing, clearly really crucial. The NITAG wouldn't look at the manufacturing as an example. They assume that's being done by the regulator. And then the post-marketing monitoring is often done by different groups, but the safety very much of interest to the NITAG for that advice. So as you can see in the yellow side of the slide, the endpoint is really giving advice to government, usually a Ministry of Health, but that may vary depending on the, the country. And then it's really thinking about how you can recommend the vaccine use um, to respond, which can be obviously what we're calling, you know, the routine national immunisation programs. And then more specifically, obviously, a lot of work went into to COVID at that public health emergency. It's really thinking about the use at a population and public level. And that advice may change over time, depending if a serious safety signal, for example, occurs, you may need to change that advice, obviously, which has happened throughout COVID. So thinking of this being a fluid body that's meeting regularly and giving advice with a regulator review is a little bit more um, clear. This is just a couple of slides from Shelley Deeks, who's the chair of um, NASI, which is the Canadian NITAG, just showing some of the change that's happened over time. So essentially this process of a vaccine going through the pathways and being regulatory reviewed, 
then coming to the NITAG often would take many years before a vaccine could be reviewed. And obviously in different countries, vaccines may be used in some countries, not available in others. So there's not necessarily an equitable um, availability of vaccines, which is clearly a big issue. But the NITAG really is trying to A, give the advice on that vaccine and through different pathways aim to have it both introduced and then evaluated. So the NITAG re review you can see in green is very much around the dosing schedule, who are your populations, the feasibility, acceptability, and, and also the, the post-marketing surveillance will be part of that planning or advice that goes to the, the Minister of Health with regards to that product. We did have a talk here at, at MCI from Andy Pollard on the, Austra Austra sorry, the AstraZeneca vaccine um, just a couple of days ago and just showed how rapidly things went. So they essentially you know, got the, the um, uh, genetic code of SARS-CoV-2 and with 300 days, you know, had a vaccine being administered as part of a public program. We know Moderna mRNA vaccine was even quicker than that. So this kind of concept of the review process and things happening parallel is much more rapid. And the planning and review then for a pandemic may need to be very rapid. I know the, the NITAG and Lau is also meeting very frequently to see how they can best use uh, a COVID-19 vaccine. So just showing that the pace of some of these um, decisions and discussions uh, can be much more rapid. So this slide's just talking back a bit more to the core principles of a NITAG. So again, it might be used for a pandemic, but the key things are really is that evidence-based advice and obviously you need potential data or capacity to have data to make those um, evidence to recommendations. The safety is crucial, as I mentioned earlier, as well as the effectiveness at the population level. Equity of the vaccine is, is key. So again, thinking about how that program is running nationally, how you can make sure it's getting to the people that it's required. Can you evaluate that uptake? Etc. is also part of that NITAG decision making. And the NITAG needs to really have clear meetings and agenda with prioritisation of those topics just, um, based on that individual country, which Vanita will talk to from the Lao perspective. It's a little bit different to SAGE. Everyone's heard of SAGE as the WHO, Immunisation Technical Advisory Group, and Kim Mulholland here at MCI is part of SAGE. They do look at the technical components and give advice, but that's a global level. So it's really very helpful to see that data and for countries to share that data. There may be WHO pre-qualification based off those deliberations, but they're not going down to the country Pacific, which will always be a little bit different. So SAGE is definitely a key advisory uh, NITAG at a global level, but there's still a need to do this at a, at a local level as well. So now to ATAGI, which is mentioned on the, the current um, chair and obviously meeting super frequently. No one knew what ATAGI was pre the pandemic. Now everyone knows what ATAGI an acronym is, even if it's a long winded one. But as mentioned, this is a technical advisory group to, to, to government and specifically to the health um, minister. It's got 15 independent uh, voting members. There's actually just been a call recently for, for members to join um, ATAGI. It obviously goes to an internal process of government to appoint. There's obviously a range of expertise was predominantly paediatricians, which would reflect the previous immunisation, but now obviously particularly adult and ID physicians and other modellers and epidemiologists and, and uh, nursing expertise, clearly crucial. Um, there needs to be a range of expertise in their, their four year terms to, to a target. There's also ex officio members. So while it's not a government body, we do get regular reports from these groups. And I think it's really important to think of both the regulator, which in Australia is the TGA, the health economics is, is crucial, we'll come to with Lau, which is for us as the, the PBAC or the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, the head of the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance, who provide the technical support to ATAGI, CDNA for the epidemiology, the Jurisdictional Immunisation Committee who deliver the vaccines at a local level, as well as the Secretariat in, in Canberra. So quite a lot of people obviously sit within that, that meeting, which are now both hybrid and face-to-face and, uh, uh, -face structured over the, the course of the year. I just want a little bit of time on the PBAC just from this health technology assessment, because again, Vanita will talk to our discussions in Laos, but the cost effectiveness or evaluation of, of uh, vaccines is, is crucial, particularly as we've come into this situation where there's sort of a lot of economic uncertainty and, and the dollars can be, can be tight. So in Australia, the PBAC obviously doesn't just do vaccines. We would say vaccines should be considered differently, but that's um, potentially because we're a little bit biased towards vaccines, but there are some certainly differences in how they may be impacted Essentially, governments at this stage are not allowed to consider a vaccine on the NIP until it's got a PBAC approval. So that's a really important step, and ATAGI provides that advice to PBAC on all the things I've mentioned earlier and I've put in the this, uh, bottom part of the slide there I won't talk to. So there's a lot of factors that go into that advice, uh, predominantly from industry. There are other ways that these submissions may come, but essentially giving advice to how a product may look on the program. If it's a brand new product or it's trying to prove that it's above and beyond the, the current um, preventative strategy. There's a cost, 
effectiveness analysis. There's already a vaccine on the program, for example, a new flu vaccine comes along. We have quite a few flu vaccines. There'd be a cost minimization analysis. So it's got to prove that they're equivalent to that vaccine at that, at that price. So in terms of the technical support acknowledgement here to Sarah Sheridan, who's part of our technical support team, clearly there's a real need for this technical support and this is something that, that I'm discussing through the LAO project, but really supporting that advice both to ATAGI as well as the immunisation handbook where lots of this background information um, resides, including the epidemiology, the safety, effectiveness of the vaccines and some of those programmatic aspects. The evidence to recommendations in terms of assessing that data is really important for Atagi now. We're using the grade process, there's other ways to do that, but that's the current process and this evidence to recommendations is, is really crucial. So that's got a couple of slides on the global NITAG network. I mentioned this earlier, Louise Hanaf from WHO is the, the lead of this group. It's really a place to centralise um, those resources, which is an excellent resource. The link is there below if you're interested to go and have a little bit of a look. There's a lot of countries that have joined this. I think over 140 countries have joined. There's now some hubs and other groups that are running some of this support at a regional level. If every country can't themselves have a NITAG, they're trying to support obviously the strengthening and capacities and evaluating some of those processes and competencies. So it's a pretty, um, I think, comprehensive website, which again, through this project, we're working closely with them and, and aim to help support some of these resources. This is one example of some of their training. I mentioned earlier the evidence evidence to recommendation process. You may not have much evidence in one country, it doesn't mean you can't make a decision. You can base it off other information that's available from other sources, but essentially there's a process that the NITAG needs to go through to really make sure this is robust and that there's a consistency of that, that approach. So uh, there's a nice training module that's available on the, the GNN website. And in terms of a NITAG assessment, there's a lot of things that sort of make up a NITAG and they've developed this assessment tool. And on the right hand side, you can see the specific sort of dynamics of some of those tools of how it might be assessed or how you might score it, depending on what they're described as the maturity of the NITAG. But just maybe focus really on this left hand side key indicators. Um, they're really encouraging a NITAG as it's set up and as it's evaluated over time that it does progress to these different levels and there needs to be a real thought around its establishment and composition independence and non-bias, obviously very important, particularly with regards to industry support or roles that members may have with industry is, is a key part of that assessment. The resources and the secretariat, not just the members who obviously make it up, it's the technical as well as the secretariat support for making sure the minutes and the meeting uh, operate in, a, in an appropriate way. A clear description of the decision-making process, which may be the grade or other ETR processes, as I've mentioned. And then lastly, how you can push that integration into policy making. How does that information go to the health minister? How visible is that in, in Australia? Once uh, the TAGI guidance has been signed off for COVID, it's gone up on the website. So obviously public disclosure is, is ideal, but that may differ depending on the country. And obviously there's always key stakeholders who need to be acknowledged, both in development of the guidance and then dissemination. So all those are indicators they use as part of that assessments tool, which we actually recently did um, at a TAGI. This is a bit of a plug for the next meeting of the Global NITAG Network. It's going to be Iman um, Jordan um, in about a month's time. Um, it's really trying to bring together this group face to face. They had a meeting last year in Ghana, the first time for around three years. And I think there's so much interest now in the vaccines and it's coming so quickly down the pipeline, new vaccines, uh, as well as introduction of vaccines that we should have hopefully have seen actually years ago. So those discussions are happening. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk on the HPV vaccine and obviously going to a single dose is a really important part of potential uh, the, the vaccine program and Australia is one of the first countries to do that. So I'm going to finish there and hand over to Fiona um, and have you take questions at the end. Thanks, uh, Darren and Alicia. Thanks, Nigel. All right, thank you very much. And thank you to Darren and uh, Alicia for the, um, yes, the bottom one, the bottom, yep, for the, uh, for the, um, invitation to come and talk today and lovely to see you online Vanita as well. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, some of the work that we've been doing um, focused on Laos uh, in terms of some of this data um, generated for immunisation policy. Uh, sorry, I'll just... Uh... So we know that in our region that um, the number of diseases protected by vaccines is sort of, um, you know, not as it should. There's a lot of vaccines that are available um, and are underutilised. And so in our region, the Asia Pacific, we're sort of, you know, not using the vaccines, uh, you know, that are available already. 
Um, sorry, I'll just use that one. Yeah. And so, in terms of um, some of the work that I've um, uh, been doing in in the region, is sort of thinking about it in in the context of the SDGs as well, in terms of the health policy context, um, in terms of the vaccination program. So having that systems and broader health uh, systems approach to you know what is a country trying to achieve in terms of SDG. Um, three, which is the good health and well-being one, and so in terms of um, for children, um, that is looking at the impact. You know, looking at reducing under five mortality, and so in that pie that's shown there in the pink triangle at the top, that's the um, mortality contribution from pneumonia or lower respiratory tract infections, um, and there's pneumococcal conjugate vaccine to help prevent that. And coming in the pipeline is RSV vaccine. And then also there's um, you know, diarrhea, which is also another big component for under five mortality. And we know that there's rotavirus vaccine available. However, when we look at rotavirus availability in our region, um, very few countries have actually implemented it into the program, even though it's such a highly um, effective and, and safe vaccine. And price is one of the big issues um, regarding that. Um, and just to you know, keep in mind that um, in terms of you know vaccine introduction, we should always keep in mind that you know a comprehensive approach. You know vaccines are just one part of a very important public health approach um, in in terms of um, you know preventing and protecting and also um, managing children who develop um, vaccine preventable diseases. And so, in terms of policy, you know all of those things um, should be looked at, um, not just the vaccination program. So how to make immunisation policy? There's a whole, you know, way through from developing vaccines to, um, as Nigel's already said, you know, looking at the burden of disease and the health economics, and and then you know the, you know the viewpoint obviously from the national immunisation program out to you know uptake and acceptability and um, and then impact evaluations. And as Nigel has already said, uh, usually. At country level, in low and middle income countries, um, heavily rely on the WHO and their recommendations that come out from SAGE. And then the country officers of WHO then discuss these things with Ministry of Health by and large, and then you know come up with a plan really whether to implement a vaccine or not. So, um, and the burden of disease and health economics is the area that, in terms of data needs, are the things that are, um, we've been sort of mainly working on. And so what we've been doing is as an academic researcher and partnering with local institutions in the region and governments is then to support the generation of the local data to help inform um, that immunisation policy and, and the NETAG or whatever it is, the decision making body within the, within the com uh, country in terms of research and disseminating uh, that research and, and then measuring the impact. And so these are some of the examples of the data um, that we've been helping to um, you know, generate and support the government, and so epidemiology and surveillance. We've done clinical trials looking at efficacy and effectiveness and safety, and then, as I've mentioned, the vaccine economics, and then supporting immunisation policy generation. Um, and there's many factors involved, so um, I'm not going to go through all of these things in terms of uptake of a vaccine, um, including the scientific aspects, which is the stuff that we've been focusing on in, in our group and um, is Natalie Cavajo, who leads the economic side, who's also with the University of Melbourne. And then there's all these other uh, factors as well. Um, and so, um, as Nigel mentioned, we've got this new project. Um, the name, I think we're still figuring out, but um, <laughs> that's, that's a draft there. And, and Vanita's leading that in Laos, and so she's going to tell, um, you know, going to tell us about that in more detail later. But my first involvement in Laos was, um, Oh, it's over 10 years ago now when the vice president had um, gone off to a meeting and decided, um, you know, with Gavi's support to introduce the HPV vaccine in Laos. And so I then worked with WHO after the decision had been made to design the pilot program with them um, to roll out. And so now that's in, in, in the program altogether. But during that time, um, uh, you know, PCV was also going to be rolled out. And so, you know, we had discussions about how they were going to measure and what data they had to sort of make that decision. And so um, we were then asked to then support the government in doing an impact evaluation to to support the ongoing because at the at that time Gavi was um, financing all the vaccines and at some stage the government would need to um, fund it and then um, and so it would be very helpful to show that 
you know, the burden of disease, but also the impact that the vaccine was having as well. And so we started um, acute respiratory infection surveillance at one hospital. Um, we've been doing that for about 10 years now, and it was pr previously funded by the Gates Foundation, Gavi and WHO, and we were doing a number of things. So, but it really provided the data needs for the for the knee tag. So we showed evidence of impact. We showed impact on serotypes and pneumonia and, the in, and, and indirect effects. And we also helped in broader terms, we've also looked at etiology of pneumonia and acute respiratory infection. Uh, and, and we've also got a system where if RSV vaccine was introduced in the future, we've come up with a method that we could um, measure the vaccine effectiveness using a single hospital-based approach. And similarly, we've looked at severity and adherence to WHO clinical guidelines as well. So it's been a very rich data source to get a whole lot of information. And we've come up with a way that countries can evaluate uh, the impact of the conjugate vaccine in the context of introducing the vaccine at the same time um, and without, with very minimal data to start with. Um, and then, um, so this was our, you know, we looked at the PCV effectiveness against hypoxic pneumonia. This was the first um, test negative case control study that was published, um, looking at um, pneumonia as an outcome. And, you know, as we know, that's the methodology used now for COVID um, vaccine. So we found it very effective against hypoxic pneumonia. And that was a really important endpoint for Lao because um, people, um, families in Lao have to well, in, at this time, I had to make decisions about whether they could afford to pay for, you know, there's no universal health care, no Medicare at the time. And so oxygen is one of the most expensive treatments. And so particularly in rural areas, so our parents had to make a decision about whether they could afford to pay for the oxygen or whether they take their child home to either recover or, you know, or not recover. Um, so very difficult decision. So very important to show how effective it was against um, pneumonia requiring oxygen. Or needing oxygen. We also showed that vaccine type ca carriage declined um, in, the, in over, you know, about an eight year period. And we showed also the indirect effects. So the children that were unvaccinated also showed a decline in vaccine types as well. Uh, and we found that the higher the coverage, the greater the indirect effects as well. So the, the more vaccine the children who are vaccinated, the better the, you know, the higher the indirect effects as well. And we also found that there was marked heterogeneity in coverage in the capital itself. So these dots show, you know, that there's different coverage levels over time as the vaccine was sort of rolled out. And we found, you know, there were pockets of higher coverage, but there were also a lot of areas that had very low coverage um, in, in the capital um, as well. Um, this data was all collated and put together for the Minister of Health who presented the results to Gavi and then also um, as a team and our team um, presented to the Lao Paediatric Society and we published in journals and we also um, disseminated through a video, um, a flyer, you know, we discussed all this with the government and then, you know, through a press release as well. Um, and we also presented um, and fed, had a feedback meeting to the Ministry of Health which was coincided with a Lao um, um, convened um, a led um, public health conference of Greater Mekong countries at the time. And so we presented all our information, all the feedback information as well. Um, and so now we've got the Centre for Research Excellence on, on pneumococcal disease control in the Asia Pacific. Um, and, and so um, that's, you know, a five year project. We have partnerships with researchers and organisations in 10 countries in our region and also the UK that are listed there. And we also, um, well, they're not official collaborators, but we're also including Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And in fact, anybody who wants to join, please join. And I think Darren's probably got the email and maybe link that if you want to join up, uh, we have a newsletter and email that come out with lots of opportunities. And so on that, we have lots of NETAG members from the region and Ministry of Health representatives and research academics, and importantly, early career researchers, including um, investigators from Lao and also uh, early career researchers from Lao as well. And so what we've brought together is that when, you know, for the data needs for PCV decision making and, and a lot of vaccines, in fact, bring together a whole lot of different areas from, you know, genomics and microbiology and immunology and the economics and the vaccinology, et cetera. So we've brought all of that, those people together um, to then, uh, you know, for PCV to identify what the key research needs are to inform policy and then really importantly to support the development of early career researchers locally and in the region as well um, 
And so we've got a number of projects on that. So Paul Licciardi is leading the, and his group, the immunological things. Um, uh, Catherine Satsky is leading the microbiology things and as, um, and through the CRE, but with other funding as well, a multi-country Empyema surveillance project. And then Natalie Cavajo, who's um, leading the vaccine economics to look at, you know, if a, if a dose was removed from the schedule, from a three to two dose, the, um, the budget impact and the cost effectiveness of that. Um, Darren um, has been fabulous and sent up, set up a website and we have a launching pad for early career researchers. So this is not unique to pneumococcal vaccine, but it's really just if you're doing research and clinical research and particular, you know, immuno, uh, infectious diseases and vaccine related to research, we have um, a launching pad where we've curated a lot of resources and also showcase a lot of the early career researcher research as well. We, uh, um, Darren uh, puts out a newsletter, which, you know, um, every a few times a year, we've had lots of seminars and workshops. Um, we've had pneumococcal genomics with Catherine's group and the Sanger Institute and setting that up in uh, Bangladesh as uh, the genomics testing lab. Um, Natalie's run workshops with health economics with Mark Jitt from the London School. We did a forum uh, last year that, and, and with uh, Jodie McBurnham's group as well and in infectious diseases um, modelling. And also um, Paul Licciardi did a workshop with the Vietnamese um, uh, Pasteur Institute and the laboratory and capacity building that they've done there. And we also have a lot of generic academic skills, particularly for early career researchers. And we ran a whole lot of webinars on all these topics to try and uh, um, upskill um, researchers to be independent researchers and publishing and things. And so we've established a regional network. Um, we have PhD and postdoc opportunities within this. As I've mentioned, lots of seminars and workshops and work in progress sessions with the ECRs um, and you know a whole lot of other things. And it's also facilitating new collaborations and we've put in other funding for other grants with our regional partners um, as well. And so, um, as I mentioned at the end of last year, we had our first forum during COVID we didn't have any face-to-face, -face, but this was our face-to-face -face meeting, which was then focusing really on um, data needs um, for you know schedules for the vaccine, in particular looking at if a schedule was changed from a three dose to a two dose. The pneumococcal vaccine is one of the most expensive in the in the in the schedule, and even though um, prices have come down somewhat, it's still a really expensive vaccine. A lot of countries in our region, even though it's been available for more than 20 years, still haven't got it. And so out of that um, was a, you know, we discussed what are the minimal data needed to switch from a three to two dose schedule. So this is in the context, as I've mentioned, countries that don't have surveillance and don't have any data, how can they convince their Ministry of Finance or their public or whoever to then, you know, switch. And also there was a call to establish a more formal Asia Pacific vaccine research network as well. And so, you know, in our forum last year, um, we had lots of registrants from many countries. We had um, government representatives and had some co-funding from the Gates Foundation, as well as a talk from um, uh, the Deputy Director of the Pneumonia Program. We had members um, from the WHO SAGE, so Kim Mulholland and Peter McIntyre. And then from WHO, we had a talk and UNICEF and uh, Targi, um, Chris Blythe and DFAT as well. And then, as I mentioned before, we had a joint workshop, which was a day and a half of training. Um, we also, through our network, we um, submitted a declaration. So last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I went to the second global forum, forum of childhood pneumonia, which was a big meeting for a lot of countries on their commitments to, you know, to reduce childhood pneumonia. And so we put in a declaration from our CRE about how we would support um, the reduction of childhood pneumonia through our program of research. We've also, um, through this network, we've had some publications, joint publications, which John has done. He's got another one on child uh, vaccines as well. Um, and currently with our LAO work, um, we're funded through the Wellcome Trust to continue doing this surveillance. And John and the team at Longmaru are looking at um, vaccine effectiveness against AMR using genomics with Catherine Satsky's group. And um, that's, you know, AMR is such a huge issue in the region. So looking at those additional uh, um, uh, values of the, of the vaccine is just really important for this region. And then also um, through the work that we've done 
uh, and ongoing is sort of again to help support um, you know we'll develop have the serotyping data so Dr Vanita will be able to analyze that to have a look at what are the current serotypes to look at formulation changes to different cheaper formulations um, to be able to then model the effect of a change of a schedule and also uh, the costing side of things as well and the costing side um, as I said Natalie Cavajo has led and you know really builds upon her work that she's done in the Pacific on introducing PCV rotor and HPV there and also the meningococcal work that she's done in terms of introducing meningococcal C vaccine into the Fiji program and so just a big thanks to everyone who's been involved um, and I'll hand over to Vanita thank you thanks Fiona um, Vanita, if you wouldn't mind sharing, I'll oh, unshare here and if you can share your screen. And whenever you're ready, Vanita, we can we can see your slides. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Anida from Monsort Hospital. I'm, I'm honored to be presenting in this um, um, joy forum meeting about Lao PDR NITEC data for decision making project. Okay, so the objective of today's talk will be uh, covering background project overview, purpose, objective, key activities, and project team. So let's start with the background. Uh, for some of you who may not know of Laos or Lao PDR is a low middle income country situated in Southeast Asia or lower Mekong region, bordering with uh, China, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So Laos is a relatively small country with an area of 236,000 square kilometers and a population of only 7.7 .7 million people. Uh, Laos PDR GDP has improved dramatically over the last 15 years with many years of positive annual growth. However, since uh, 2014, the growth continued to decrease and especially during uh, 2019, onwards and the annual growth was negative uh, at 2% in 2021, which is slightly associated with COVID-19 pandemic, making the result GDP in 2021 only 2,536 per capita. So despite uh, the positive progress made um, throughout the world, especially in East Asia and Pacific region and Lao PDR to reduce uh, under five mortality rate, since 1990 to 2021, Lao PDR's under-5 mortality rate in 2021 is still far above the SDG target of 25 per 100,000 uh, per 1,000 live births. To achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 3, it is necessary to achieve universal health coverage and end on the preventable dates of under-5. The government is uh, strongly committed to achieve the universal health coverage aiming for 2025, which also include improving access and uptake of routine and auto immunization in the country for all children. However, there are significant challenges to the sustainability and impact of the key health interventions, in particular in the context of reducing external funding, especially from GAVI, uh, which is the main partner supporting the national immunization program and uh, subsidize vaccine costs and provide funding for the program support for the NIP. So the country has been moving from low to middle, low to from low income country to low to middle income country, and therefore in the GAVI transition, the country has entered into the accelerated trans transition in 2017 and was planned to be fully self-financed in 2023. However, due to COVID-19 pandemic and many other reasons, the country is currently not able to reach the goal in time. Um, this is where we are now. And the accelerated transition phase then was extended and expected to be achieved by year 2026-27. So Lao PDI has a well-functioning NITEC established in 2013 and reformed in 2017. Uh, it is 
responsible for making recommendation to the NIP and MOH on immunization matters, including current vaccine use, new vaccine introduction and implementation strategies. This slide all the um, NITAC. So a project to establish a unit uh, for health evidence and policy or UHEP at the University of Health Science, UHSH in Lapida is underway with the aim to institutionalizing capacity, system and structure for evidence-based health policy decision-making in the country. You have is supported mainly by Longru, Moru, and the HITAP, and the latter two is based in Thailand. The Australian Expert Technical Assistance Program Policy Planning and Implementation, or ATAP key, funded by BFAC uh, with secretaries and core technical support provided by NCR, NCRS and members from the area provide support in the Indo-Pacific region including immunization-related advice, mentoring, MOH, and all the agencies in the country. Therefore, this is a great opportunity for the uh, HFP to support Lao M MOH, UHAP, and NITAP um, in um, evidence-based decision-making in relation to immunization policy. So now let's move to the project overview. So the project consists of two phases. Phase one is uh, in the first quarter of 2023, which was complete. And phase two is in the progress and has started since April and expected to be in, in June 2024. The key activity in phase one consists of visit to Laos and include the Lapida Australian NITEC co-design meeting uh, in three days, meeting in February, March 2023. Uh, subsequently, the outcome from this phase has informed our uh, Second scope of work with the key activities being undertaken in the in phase two, outlined in the next slides. So the phase two purpose and objective have been based on the ATP uh, advice team in collaboration with all the country partners and support to the MOH you have USH and NITEX. So there are six main purpose and objective. The first one is to provide advice informing key decision for the Lao immunization program, in particular to review of the existing EPI with regard to example to those PCV, one dose HPV or rotavirus vaccine introduction. The second one is to the first one is to build the capacity within the MOH you have and or NITAC with technical support so that the local team can independently conduct similar reviews and analysis in the future. The third purpose objective is through the first and second to assist the MOH and you have in establishing a formal process for evidence-based health policy analysis for decision making. The next one is to support the NITAC secretaries and members to strengthen the current internal process, including GRI and SOP. The fifth one is to support the and review of communication for any serious AEFI identified from Lao immunization program. And lastly, to support advocacy and education process relating to any change to the immunization program that have been recommended by the Lao PDR NITEC and endorsed by MOH. Key activities in phase two are as follow. So there are three main uh, purpose key activities. Uh, first, build the capacity of the key Lao counterparts who have been identified for the focus of this project. Secondly, provide support to the Lao counterparts in the review of the existing EPI. Lastly, together with Lao counterparts support consideration into how NITEC recommendation may be implemented in the context of existing Lao PDR planning, budgeting, and service delivery system. Talking about human resource capacity building, um, the main activity include in-person, online training, supervision, and delicate mentoring of the identified local members, face-to-face in-country workshop, including health economic basic training and other identified topics, online and visual, regular journal crops, monthly telecon on the clinical case of AEFI, and a visual visit to the ATAGI. Additional uh, activities include health and economic advanced training application, which is expected to be in November this year, and support the development of um, immunization policy brief using the identified case study, support advocacy with key decision makers at the MOH by assisting with the development of the materials based on case in both English 
and Laos, close engagement in the evaluation of the project and model of support. The project will also provide funding for the few NITEC and you have members to attend training at the fifth GNN meeting in June in Jordan. There is also a plan for HTA training workshop organized by HITAP, which will be carried out initially in July in La PDA as a modified course based on the basic and practical course. Later in the year, a few members will be attending advanced course in Thailand. With the project support, the team will also join the HTACR link conference in Malaysia in September to further strengthen the HTA skill and knowledge. In terms of the support review of the existing EPI, we will use ETR or evidence to recommendation framework, um, which will be used uh, using the case study, including uh, PCV looking at the changing vaccine formula from three to two doses schedule uh, for cost saving purposes, and Rotavelas as new vaccine introduction by looking at additional epidemi epidemiology and cost effective evidence. The evidence to recommendation process will be created and based on the uh, WHO recommendation framework and, and adapt locally. And the training will be in country workshop and online webinars. And talking about the project team, um, so our project is very fortunate to be led by two experts in the field, including Professor Nigel Crawford and Professor Fiona Russell from MCRI. All the project advisory group members consist of local foreign experts in lab PDI in Australia, namely Dr. Sarah Seridan from NCIS, uh, Associate Professor Mary Rochelle from University of Sydney, Professor Chris Bly from uh, Teleton Kids Institute, University of Western Australia, Professor Mai Fong Mai Sai from USH UHAP, Associate Professor Kampe Pung Swat Naitak Chair, and um, Dr. Pon Passer. Unapon, Department of Hygiene and Health Promotion. Professor Elizabeth Ashley from Lomru, Dr. Nyambab uh, Batman from WHO, Dr. Privena Garanaran from Chai, and Associate Professor Natalie Kavago from University of Melbourne. There are also two project coordinators and local support, including Dr. Pontip Suan Nong Thong and myself, in which I'm honored and thankful to be part of the team and make uh, the contribution. Lastly, I would like to thank and acknowledge our project team leaders, Professor Nigel and Professor Fiona, and all advisory team members for their valuable input and expert contribution. Very importantly, thanks to the main funder, DFAC, and all the funders and collaborators. Uh, last but not least, all the team members whose name may not be mentioned here, but has played an important role in the development and successful of the project. Thank you so much again uh, for having me here to share this project with you. And if you have any questions or suggestions, please ask or later contact me via this email address. Thank you. Thank you, Vanita. Thank you to our three speakers today. We, we do actually have a couple of minutes. We were running a bit behind, but we've got a couple of minutes for some questions. If there's any, any from the audience or, or from online, please post on the Q&A. Um, just while you're having a think, I've, I've got one to throw out you. This is a very new area for me and, and learning about Atagia and, and NITAGs. The complexity that you, you, you demonstrate of how many members are you know, part of a NITAG and how you go about establishing it. I guess for the countries who don't have an ITAG established as yet. I imagine a lot of them are sort of relying on the same WHO recommendations. For those, for those in, in the country, in the Ministry of Health, how do, they, how do they navigate that space or what recommendations can you do to sort of recommend working their way towards an ITAG but obviously not having that established as yet? I'm the first, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the first, just sort of based on experience stuff we've been doing. So a lot of countries have ITAGs but, you know, but don't call them an ITAG and don't um, I guess all those processes that Nigel presented, you know, in terms of the SOPs and things, um, they mightn't have all that, but they certainly have a committee and they may call it like a VPD committee or, you know, an immunisation coordinating committee or something like that. So there's, and they have multiple partners on that. So the UN plays a very big role. So UNICEF um, and WHO, so taking those WHO recommendations at country level and then UNICEF obviously supports with logistical type things, obviously with ministry and any other NGOs as well, like CHAI has a very big um, um, 
you know, presence in many countries to support the logistical side of things too, and cold chain and ordering the number of needles and all those sorts of things, those sorts of things and uptake issues and training materials and all that kind of stuff. So um, that, that, that all exists, you know, so I think the, um, and then in terms of collating the data at a country level, as Nigel measured to have a, a local meeting and who prepares the slides, heavy reliant on WHO. The WHO at this point, and they may, you know, obviously some local data from their local CDC as well, and things like that, you know, will be put together as well. But um, but um, the formalisation of the process, I guess, is is variable from country to country, and I think Nigel can comment on that with that tool and the, you know, the what do you call it, maturity of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm going to make a few more yeah. comments. So, to acknowledge Vanita first, that was a fantastic yeah. presentation. She's also as the translator at our co-design meeting, so we <laughs> had the tag team going when we were in Lao. But that was a yeah, fantastic summary. Well done, Vanita, bringing together what was obviously a complex, you know, discussion around the the co-design meeting. Um, I think an initial thought is actually joining the Global NITAID network. The people who are involved with different countries, um, they're very open to joining. And once you join, there is a lot of access to some of those resources which may or may not be available directly or mightn't heard of. Um, they give access to four people who've joined to listen into the SAGE meeting. So actually you can dial in and listen to those discussions, which can be helpful if you're on a particular topic. You might want to hear about the presentation on you know, pneumococcal or whatever's being discussed at SAGE would be useful. They're now organising every the two weeks post a SAGE meeting, there's a summary which goes for about an hour as a webinar, which you can listen in and ask questions of Kate O'Brien or someone leadership from WHO immunisation to actually talk through the SAGE recommendations, which is, makes it a little bit more translatable than just sort of reading, you know, the documents afterwards, particularly with translation can be difficult. So they're trying hard to set up some resources that can help, you know, set up a country's NITAG or equivalent. But as Fiona mentioned, not every country is going to have either capacity or the size to commit to that. So there's one strategy has been to set up a bit of a hub. So the African hub um, was discussed at the Ghana NITAG meeting where some of those questions a bit more regional might be able to be discussed and then specific countries still make a decision, but you might be able to have some of that shared um, across the region might be one option. So I think there's different strategies of how different countries might approach it. Um, but yeah, I think joining the, the, the global NITAG work and strengthening that centrally is, is probably a good start point. Thank you. Uh, we don't seem to have any questions online, but any other questions from the room? Yes, please. Um, I just had a question just with regards to data, because obviously what, you, what your recommendations are are so much based on the data and the evidence. So in a country like Laos, in terms of their microbiology labs and their processes, what purport, like? Just, I'm just thinking back to kind of Australia and our setting. So we find that 50% of our invasive pneumococcal isolates are PCR alone, and the other 50% are culture. So how, like, how does it work in Laos, and, and how do we kind of get the, the same information to be able to do that serotyping and understand kind of the epidemiology locally? I can I can talk on pneumococcus, and it'd be good for Vanita if you can talk on rotavirus, but certainly. Um, yeah, so the data availability is is an issue, and um, and it's really how much is enough. You know, you're not going to have perfect data. I mean, you just not. And not even here has perfect yeah, data. We've seen that. So, it, but it's how much is enough. So we know for you know we're not, um, we know for pneumo pneumococcus across the board. If you've got a high under five mortality. And mind is the number one reason why children now end up in hospital. Number one, why they die from pneumonia. You know that's known from other places. So there's no reason to think that Laos or Cambodia or anywhere is going to be anywhere different. Um, in terms of the serotypes, invasive disease globally is very limited. WHO is trying to do surveillance for a whole range of reasons. It hasn't taken. People don't like lung punctures. There's the whole. You, know, you have to pay to have a test and you know the laboratory issues and blah 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 there's a whole range of things so we've been amongst other groups but probably one of the leaders really in looking at pneumococcal carriage so carriage is a you need to have carriage before you get disease and so we've been looking at well, what is the role of carriage in terms of because you can do a carriage survey and, and that's what we didn't allow so we came up with a whole new way of figuring out the burden is an impact in somewhere like Lao that doesn't have perfect systems like invasive disease surveillance. So we've come up with a whole new 
methodology. And, and that's mo most of the work that I've been doing is also if you've got missing data or if you've got, how can you get enough data to be able to be, and also, because this is the, one of the key things was that, um, you know, when I first worked, you know, went in layout 10 years ago, there was really a, a perception that pneumococcal disease didn't exist, really, because you can't, you know, everyone wants much in the lab and whatever. And so we did a carriage survey and showed that 50% of the kids carry pneumococcus. You know, and so that was, oh, wow, you know, yeah, it's everywhere. Kind yeah. Of so, you know, you know, so it's really, um, it's figuring out really what what are the key things that need to be known and what is the minimal need of going on. I'll just hand over to Vanita for, you know, you've been looking at all the d disease data for rotavirus, for example, Vanita. So maybe if you want to summarise what you've been doing for that. Yes, um, thank you for the question and giving opportunity to give some information. So um, in terms of rotavirus and gastroenteritis, uh, data availability here is also limited. Though we have a um, start and sentinel surveillance in uh, uh, Central Hospital Mohoso where I'm working since uh, 2008, and we have two publications uh, showing uh, at least um, in the first publication, so showing 50% uh, cause of um, um, acute gastroenteritis needing hospital admission. And on the second publication, showing a, a reduction to about 30 to 40% of hospital admission. And then in 2018, we actually had additional surveillance site in the south of the country, uh, Jambasak Provincial Hospital. However, the outcome showed that uh, and the percentage of um, uh, hospitalization from gastroenteritis due to rotavirus is still similar, like 30 to 40 percent uh, in both sides. And, and there's no, uh, no data on dead case and severe case that need ICU admission. And which we think that this is, we can't really say that this is what it actually is, because it's really uh, maybe may, may quite poor representative of what is actually happening because the sentinel side only happen in two sides and uh, only people who have access to um, to the hospital could, could come to the hospital. Some people may die at home or go to the healthcare center and, and, and get treated, uh, and et cetera. And so the risk representative of the, of the data is uh, questionable. And, and therefore with the coming up this project with uh, Fiona's uh, suggestion, because uh, previously Fiona supervised a master degree student doing a misdata on uh, identification of burden. And this is burden for uh, pneumonia and rotavirus in, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region. And, and we, for this project, we actually could use that data to actually identify and, uh, and find out the, the real epidemiology and, and impact of rotavirus gastroenteritis on the uh, under five uh, child mortality in Laos. I don't know if Fiona, you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I'll just sort of say also, yes. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, there's a, a bit of some local data, but also to be very aware that um, the, the disease, um, you know, like rotavirus is the same kind of everywhere. What, what is different is the mortality, which is access to care, which will vary and by and large. But, you know, by and large, in an unvaccinated population, the proportion of children that end up in hospital with rotavirus with diarrhoea is kind of so the same, but it's the mortality that's different. For pneumococcus, there's a little bit of difference with serotypes, um, uh, by and large. So that's, and also the same thing, though. The mortality is the, um, but the vaccines that are currently available are good anyway. You know, so uh, as well. So, uh, and similarly for HPV, the genotypes that cause cancer are kind of the same everywhere as well. So, you just want some data, I guess, to support uh, by and large, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and yeah. the recommendations for 15 valent or 20 valent moving into, you know, if we are going to reduce doses, because we saw that the serotype prevalence is three is kind of becoming the predominant serotype, and that's contained within the 15, 20. That's something that is perhaps being considered. I don't know what's happening with Australia, but certainly we know that the US has just introduced. Yeah, well, well three is a failure, you know, yes. vaccine failure. So, right. it's, you know, take that one out. But really, it's what is the additional benefit of those additional serotypes? And, um, you know, that'll vary by setting to some degree. But I don't know, you've probably seen a local 
Australian Yeah, data. I think it's probably a bit off topic. Really. <laughs> if there's sort of new vaccines coming yeah. in combinations. I'm probably more back to the question of um, data needs is that everyone wants their own data. It's a tension in a, in a night tag because you want your own site, you want your own data, you want to be able to evaluate it. But in reality, the country next door may have it or even in Australia, we didn't have national surveillance for rotavirus until I think Victoria four years ago after we started the program oh, in 2007. Oh. I mean, the lab, we knew it was a yeah. burden, but it wasn't part of a national notifiable because oh. every state has to take those things on and you know, the measurement is, is variable. And same for HPV. If you're going to wait for the impact, the cancer's 20 years after, you can't You've missed the boat of 20 years. So the decision around a single dose is based on immunogenicity and duration of protection and comparison of you know, doses across. So I think there's always this tension between wanting to have perfect data versus maybe having some pilot data you know, on rotavirus or having a couple of sensible sites that can measure it and confirm the impact rather than expecting to have a whole country surveillance program up and running before you start the introductions. It would be ideal, but not sustainable. Possible, you know, possible everywhere yeah. and the US are real outlier because they never like to change a dose and always want to no. be the first country you know economically so it's a little bit different yeah. in terms of the, the mechanism anyway we might just go with um, one final question in the, in the interest of time so this is Dr. Itob from UGM in Indonesia um, so welcome uh, Dr. Itob uh, it's uh, Dr. Itob said that mostly the recommendation of vaccination given by NITAGS is for the EPI uh, so one, uh, what about vaccinations that are outside of the EPI? Uh, what is the role of NITAG for those vaccines? Uh, and secondly, uh, some disease burden um, is not recognized because of a lack of surveillance. Uh, so what is the NITAG's role in recommending, uh, uh, rec in providing recommendations to the MOH for these diseases uh, that don't really have um, surveillance data? I'm happy to talk to the, the first one. So I think that the EPI was the traditional, you know, mechanism, as mentioned, SAGE and recommendation and the EPI. I think COVID changed all that because, again, most countries weren't running on a similar program in terms of it being standard into the EPI. There was different procurement processes, both for vaccines as well as obviously COVAX, you know, and, and vaccine introduction. So I think COVID kind of flipped things a little bit and every country will have different pressures and different recommendations that may come a little bit separately. HPV, I think, in, in Lao being a good example. So the NITAG needs to be using a systematic approach, like this evidence to recommendations, to approach whatever the question might be and then apply it. And then the funding, you know, obviously a lot of countries will still be Garvey, but Lao, we haven't mentioned Garvey transition is a big issue, which we'll be discussing as part of our project there. So the funding is part of it, but health financing of itself is a separate to the NITAG, which is meant to be sticking a little bit more to the impact in you know the inputs into the model and other components but as soon as you start getting into the financing and other components it, it does get more problematic if you want to comment further yeah yeah I, well the second question there about the surveillance and the role of the knee tag and recommending it i suppose i can't comment necessarily on that but just from a public health point of view and i'd like to know what role australians the target has in that or, or if it doesn't or not but but in terms of, um, I guess it, you know, again, it depends on um, what the government needs to make a decision, and uh, and you know that comes back to the, you know, um, the, the the terms of reference, I guess, of the Atagi and and what their role is in informing government. So, um, and and the data needs to be able to do that. You know, some countries it's surveillance and burden of disease and health economics. Um, or plus or minus health economics, not all are health economics. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the, you know, as you would know, ETOB and many countries, if there's vaccine available through Gavi, then it's really based on a WHO recommendation. And if there's a financing mechanism, then the vaccine is introduced, um, you know, without much data at all. But the issue now, and, and increasingly so, is because of that, is that how do you convince then the Ministry of Finance to then pay for it once Gavi goes away? So that's the issue. And so that's what a lot of countries are in now is having to show, well, what's this vaccine doing, you know, if we don't have any data? So that's kind of the issue. And that's sort of the, some of the stuff that we've been doing, I suppose, and showing evidence of impact. Because we feel, certainly in the way that where we've been working, is that that's been a really powerful mechanism to ensure sustainability of the vaccine program. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to continue all of that forever, but if you're showing that 30% reduction in hypoxic pneumonia or, you know, 50% reduction in meningitis or whatever, 
then that's really powerful to, for, to show to the Ministry of Health and Finance. But so I suppose it varies from disease to disease. And there's some diseases, of course, like pneumococcus, where it is important to know, you know, about serotype replacement. So you do want to have some sort of surveillance going on. Whereas other things like rotavirus, like in my view anyway, this is my view and maybe nobody else has its view, but you know, but it's very important to show burden of disease. You can show impact with the vaccine coming in, but then once you've shown impact, what is the purpose of it? You know, really, it's an expensive thing. You know, what, what would need to happen if there was, a, if you stop surveillance would be, if there was a diarrhea outbreak, then you do confirmatory testing in that outbreak and you see what it is. Is it, as you know, norovirus or, is it a you know rotor and what genotypes is it or whatever? That that's sort of my kind of personal view on that. I know WHO still does that surveillance, but I think you have to then you know you have to take some hard decisions because you know surveillance costs a lot of money. So you know and when money's an issue, then you have to then figure out what is it re you really need to know. And each infection is different, I think, and each decision is different. So it's sort of a one by one to some degree. Yeah, just a couple of comments. I think I mentioned the Communicable Disease Network of Australia is sort of ex officio on a target, so we do get a regular update on the epidemiology, which is important. The HPV is linked directly to the um, screening register or cervical screening register, which obviously Julia Brotherton and others have been leaders in, you know, showing the changes with the vaccine and, and any changes to the vaccine program made an impact on that, which is an um, important part of um, surveillance. And probably looking ahead, RSV is the next one. People might have heard GSK's vaccine's just been authorised in the US. It's been 60 years since we've had a vaccine, you know, considered a licence for, for RSV. So um, lack of evidence of that information on that, of that infection in adults and obviously paediatric, we need to have more data. Not every country will necessarily have data on RSV. It is going to be important. You mentioned in your pneumonia discussion. So I think internationally we need to think about RSV epidemiology and I know, um, I'm sure SAGE, are, getting organised for that as well. So I think that's a good example of the epi will need to think pre and then post any any um, preventative introduction. Do you want to wrap up? Sure. Yes, yeah. uh, yeah, so, um, I guess that's uh, all for today. So th uh, thank you very much to um, Fiona and Nigel, as well as Dr. Vanita um, for, for joining us online from Lao. And uh, yeah, if we can just uh, give another round of applause to all the speakers. Um, so I will share a seminar feedback uh, form after the seminar and would appreciate if, uh, you know, anyone, uh, everyone who attended could please uh, take a minute or two to complete that so we know, uh, you know, how we can improve as well as uh, potentially future uh, seminar and workshop topics. Uh, so just a reminder that uh, our next uh, MCGH forum will be on the 30th of May. Uh, and the topic will be the decentralization of services to end tuberculosis. And if you'd like to get in touch uh, with us, us being uh, the Melbourne Children's Global Health or the CRE for pneumococcal disease control, uh, we've got our um, email uh, addresses up there. And uh, yeah, please email us. Uh, so thank you once again to all the speakers and thanks for joining us today. Thanks everyone.